friends, some words of Torah for Parshat Chaye Sarah. Why do so many people hate the Jews? And why is it that the anti-Semites so often come from religious communities that share common values and religious ideologies? As we'll see, this goes back all the way to the very first Jew, Avraham. After finding a suitable wife for his son Yitzchak, Avraham decided to get married again. We can certainly understand the human aspect of an older man's loneliness. After all, everyone needs companionship, and as the Torah says, it is not good for man to be alone. But why is it chronicled in the Torah? What lesson should we take from Avraham's marriage to the woman named Keturah? The Abarbanel provides six reasons why this episode of Avraham's life is detailed in the Torah and what lessons we may learn. For example, one lesson is that Avraham was careful to marry off his son before moving on with his own life and remarrying himself. We learn from this that a parent has to make sure his children's lives are settled before he takes care of his own marriage. Another lesson from this story is that one only needs to be careful about Yichus, good pedigree, when marrying his first wife. Avraham was careful to marry a member of his family, Sarah, because he knew that she would be the mother of his children. We choose someone from good stock to ensure that they will produce children of a fine pedigree. But since Avraham had already sired the one son from whom God had told him, Ki bi Yitzchak yikarei lechazara, that Yitzchak will be your sole heir and successor, Avraham wasn't worried so much about Yichus when choosing his second wife. As long as she was a good woman and a good companion, that was just fine. Abarbanel's first reason, however, is truly intriguing. When Hashem changed his name from Avram to Avraham, adding the extra letter He, he instructed Avraham that it was because Ki av hamon goyim netaticha, I have made you as the father of a multitude of nations. Avraham saw it as his God-mandated destiny to sire many children so that he could fulfill Hashem's charge that he would be the father not of just one nation, but of many nations not just the patriarch of the Jewish people. You know, we normally associate Avraham with the particular history of the Jewish people, but a careful reading of Hashem's changing of Avraham's name teaches us that just the opposite is true. It's true that the one son who is the chosen son is Yitzchak, but Avraham needed to sire other children who would inherit his universal values of ethical monotheism for two reasons. One, in order to preserve the Jewish people. We need allies in the world throughout our long and arduous history in the diaspora. Hashem was signaling to Avraham that there will come times when the Jews will need to rely on the kindness of strangers. And therefore, you, Avraham, need to propagate those chasidei umot ha'olam, those kind gentles of, uh, Gentiles of the future who will possess your kind attributes. But the second reason, as taught by the Nitziv, is that Hashem's objective for all mankind is to recognize the one true God. He told Avraham to pass on his legacy not only to the Jewish people, but also to other nations who would be receptive to that same biblical message of ethical monotheism. In order for us to be a light to the nations, there needs to be a prior receptivity implanted within these nations that originates from Avraham. Yet, there's a certain irony to this whole divine plan. Throughout history, the Jews' greatest enemies have been from Yishmael and Bnei Keturah, as well as Esav, who was Yitzchak's son. For example, when reading about the sale of Yosef, the Torah lists three ethnic groups who participated in the sale, the Yishmaelites, the Midianites, and the Midanites. Yishmael is Avraham's son from Hagar, and Midjan and Midan were both Avraham's sons from Keturah. We certainly know about Edom's hatred of the Jews, personified by the Holy Roman Christian Empire, and Edom is a descendant of Avram through Aesop. We also know too well about the anti-Semitism from Ishmael's descendants of the Islamic faith. So did Avraham's plan, or did God's plan, backfire? Some commentaries indeed suggest that Avraham was wrong to have children from Hagar and Keturah, and that is the reason why we suffer from their descendants to this day. Actually, one sefer called Soror Hamor, whose author lived through the Spanish Inquisition of 1492, suggests that that's why his generation was suffering. However, according to the Abarbanel and others, Avraham was simply following the divine plan. Their persecution is a natural outgrowth of their being so close to us. There's a cryptic story in the Gemara that will help explain this idea. 
Rabbi Tarfon's nephews were once sitting before him, completely silent. To break the awkward silence, Rabbi Tarfon deliberately misquoted a verse. Instead of stating that Avraham's new wife was Keturah, he called her Yuchni. The nephews all piped up and corrected him. Her name was Keturah, they said. Rabbi Tarfon said, aha, you children are children of Keturah. Now, what did he mean by that? The story offers an important insight. Rabbi Tarfon was a wealthy man. There was likely some jealousy between Rabbi Tarfon and his sister's family. And so while the nephews knew that they needed to show Uncle Tarfon respect, they resented him nonetheless. Rabbi Tarfon deliberately misquoted the verse in order to show them that he understood their passive-aggressive silence. You have latent resentments against me. The proof is, the first chance you get to prove me wrong, you jump up enthusiastically. But this is the way of the world. We resent people with whom we are closest. If we see Elon Musk making billions, we don't become jealous. But if my brother-in-law makes $100,000 more than me, I think, what does he have that I don't have? This is the Nisayon, the test, that is placed upon the other nations. Hashem wanted Avraham Avinu to sire many nations so that they would be able to relate kindly to his chosen progeny and their message. But the double-edged sword is that because of our kinship, these nations will often resent and even hate the Jews. The Gemara articulates this with an oath that God imposed upon the other nations. It says that God made the other nations swear, That is, no matter how much you see the Jews prospering, you must not unduly oppress them. Don't allow your resentment and jealousy to get the best of you. Sadly, our cousins Esav and Yishmael have not abided by this oath. There was another oath imposed by God, this time upon the Jewish people. Shalom Ya'alu Yisrael Bachoma, that they would not immigrate en masse to Eretz Yisrael. But as the commentaries observe, once the other nations broke their oath, the Jews were no longer bound by our oath, which is why we have a state of Israel today, a sanctuary from the excessive oppression of the other nations. This has been the struggle with Yishmael, the Bnei Keturah, and Esav from time immemorial. We are called upon to not flaunt our chosenness and success, and instead to be a light upon our cousin nations. But there's an equal call to the other nations that they must not allow their resentment to cloud their ability to draw influence from us and to absorb the Abrahamic message of the Torah. And so, dear friends, may both we and Avraham's other descendants all play our respective roles correctly so that we may usher in a new era of redemption. Let's certainly hope we see it very soon, an end to all conflict, an ushering in of a peaceful era. May we see it. Here's wishing you a beautiful Shabbos. Shabbat Shalom.